our very first Hardy's Hotline episode of 2022. <laughs> I am your host, Tammy Clements, the Hooked Hardy, and we have, if you missed the announcement, somebody special here. We have <laughs> my best friend, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. She I'm so excited is, to be here. Yes, and she is our brand new host. If you missed the announcement, Casey is having to take a step back. Her job is getting crazy, and she has a lot of commitments with family and things like that, and she just needs to take a step back from the podcast. And my dear friend Sarah has graciously said that she will come on and be my new partner. So here she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here. It was really fun guest hosting um, last year, and it's it's going to be so much fun. We always talk about the show so much, so it'll be a fun way to do it in a little bit different way. Now, if you notice, Sarah has some lovely props behind her, and uh, I'm going to show that... <laughs> We may or may not have matching props. <laughs> we do. We do. Way back when we were on uh, the winning Camp Hardy's team. Yes, um, we won. It was so much fun. We did fun. win. That was a lot of fun. We've got our, our team pillow prize. <laughs> and uh, Sarah, what is that <gasps> ghastly thing pinned to your sweater is it, isn't it beguiling it, it it should surprise and delight you <laughs> well obviously there's this a is, story behind this <laughs> most hardies will probably recognize the importance of a spider brooch but this was a very special birthday present from miss cammy to me um and i treasure it so much um i don't wear it often um, because it's a spider brooch, um, but I adore it. And it is a big part of my Hardy's memorabilia <laughs> with, with my mug, with the mug. Well, and okay. Hardy, you have to understand that Sarah's birthday is in October. So what better gift to give her than a spider brooch? It kills two birds with one stone. <laughs> and it did surprise and delight me when I opened oh, the package. <laughs> <laughs> I have video footage of her opening said brooch. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we are here to talk about the very first parties event of the year. We are here to talk about that lovely event of When Hope Calls Christmas with special guest star appearances by none other than Daniel Lissing and Lori Lachlan. The first appearance since season was six. There we go. And <laughs> which one you're talking about. Um, season six of One Calls the Heart. <laughs> I almost said the wrong number. Shame on me. <laughs> Goodness. Um, yeah. It, what an amazing idea to to bring them both back uh, for this Christmas movie. And it was really a great way to tie the two shows together again and kind of show the connections between Hope Valley and Brookfield and um, really bring in those those people that may not have seen the show the first year. Um, this being the beginning of the second season for When Hope Calls, um, yeah. kind of a way to really bring those hardies in and show them those connections. And, you know, I thought that this was the perfect thing to bring them on because not only did it connect the shows, but it's, you know, testing the waters a little bit. And I think that the reception of Abigail Stanton was very well received. And I think that a lot of us missed her on our, on our TV screens and missed the wise words of Abigail Stanton. And, you know, she didn't miss a beat. She hadn't missed a beat. She was exactly, she was the exact Abigail that I remembered. Exactly. Um, I didn't, I didn't have any moments where I was like, oh, she seems like she's a little different now or, or mm -hmm. out of practice um, or that the character has changed in, in what the experiences are that she's been through. 
um, it very much seemed like that Abigail that we know and love and, yeah. and miss. Um, and, and really just right down to the way she phrased things. Um, you know, when she first got off the stagecoach and, and addressed, um, and addressed him saying constable, um, just hearing her say that word, I kind of got chills. I was like, Oh, that's exactly, you know, how she used to address yeah. Jack. Um, yeah. and it, and it, it was just a great way to start that, that special out. It was, it was, and, you know, bringing in the whole storyline of her having gone back East to take care of her mother and then bringing in the storyline of and incorporating an orphan and saying it's run, uh, the orphanage is run by my cousin and she is having a terrible time with this boy. And I remembered that you really connected with the children that you brought into your home. And I just went, oh my goodness, it's, that's brilliant. It, it's, it's great. It's a great way to bring her in and to have it make sense. Mm -hmm. It was, it yeah. really seemed seamless. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Abigail had adopted children as well in the past, just kind of had that full circle. I felt like she, she really knew she needed to do this. It, yeah. it, it had purpose and it made sense for her character um, to have made that journey for that, for that reason. Absolutely. Okay. But before we get any deeper, let's talk about some of the differences in Brookfield that we, that we saw in, in season one that have changed in season two or the beginning of season two, rather. So oh. the first very obvious is Chuck and Grace are gone. <laughs> it's, right. It's so sad. <laughs> it, it is. It's one of those things like all TV shows go through those kinds of things and, and uh -huh. cast can't stay the same. And, and, you know, we're just going to have to acknowledge that this, this show was gone for a longer period of time than most between seasons and, mm -hmm. and went through different, different changes that you wouldn't normally have to expect year to year on a series. And yeah. what are you going to do? Like, you know, it's been a few years and that people have to move on. And, and so it totally makes sense. You can't quit um, working. Yeah. You can't quit working and, and just hope that something is going to come through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, hopefully there's going to be a way to see those characters again at some point in the future. Um, who knows? Um, but I love that they set it up in a way that, that again, made sense for the characters yeah. um, and where they were in their life. And they also really acknowledged um, in general, all the people that were missing um, in the town. Yes. And, and, oh my and gosh, that they, they made a point not to create a, a Brookfield black hole. <laughs> I loved that. Every single person that you said, wait a minute, where are they? There was an explanation. I, I did. I loved that. And they you talked know, about the children. Say, yeah. And one thing we have to say about Chuck and Grace is they're married. Yeah. <laughs> That didn't take them long. <laughs> well, and there you go. They gave us a really quick, happy ending for, for a couple. And now yeah. they're, they can, they can take their time with characters that are on the show right. because they've, they, what, we just married somebody off. <laughs> <laughs> now here was, this was an interesting change, but I really liked it. Maybe it's because I'm partial to red hair, but. Maggie's hair, hair, Maggie's hair, it went from blonde to red and I really liked it. I thought that, I thought that it suited her. So, um, you know, it didn't jump out at me in really? that way. Um, but I mean, I thought it was that she was beautiful, but I didn't like note the hair color change so much. Oh man, I did. Um, <laughs> Oh, you were done. Okay. Done. <laughs> I thought you were going on. Uh, I didn't. So I didn't note the hair color change. Okay. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> okay. Now this, I couldn't help but laugh at this one. 
but we noticed that Pearl was gone. Yes. But they covered that. They said they that, covered her that. Niece, it's her niece. Her niece bought the bakery. Did you catch her niece's name? Uh, Debbie, I yes. believe. So I could not help but think little Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's making pastries and cakes and just. I can see that. That's a good connection. Oh, yeah. oh man, I could, I, I could not help it. It jumped into my head. <laughs> she was very sweet, and I really liked um, that character. I thought it was a good really um, addition, um, and it will be really fun to see kind of where that, where that goes. I'd like to hear more about, you know, why Pearl left, um, mm -hmm. but, but I'm glad that they covered it. And that's, that's, I just, I didn't see any points where I was confused by anything. And, and after such a long break, you would expect that, that there might be some, some areas that get missed or but fall. Yeah. And some gaps. Yeah. We already talked about the children, but Fred and Christian, and I loved how they did it. These were their beds, but they got adopted. I just thought, oh my goodness, that's, that's perfect. And Vincent says, we still write to each other. And I thought, you know, that's, that's a really sweet way to keep them relevant and, yes. to, and to acknowledge that this is an orphanage and there are going you to would be hope. kids. Yeah. There are going to be kids who would hope that would go in and go out. How yeah. sad, how sad that would be if it was just the same kids year after year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, quite honestly, um, they're in a loving home and, and they've got a great, a great place to live with Lillian, but that's not, you know, they're, they're hopefully looking for a forever home. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's one, there's one that I want to talk about, but I want to save it to okay. make it its own conversation. So, okay. so I'm going to come back to that one. Ooh, the suspense is killing you, I bet. But, uh, <laughs> let's talk about Ronnie's beard <laughs> <laughs> well I have to admit that when he walked on screen with the beard um the first thing that I thought was oh Cammy's not gonna like this uh <laughs> he's got facial hair she knows me so well <laughs> um but the, and then I was like well you know it's been a couple years the actor might just have a beard now and you gotta you know go with the flow. It's been some time has passed. Um, but I loved how they addressed it right off the bat and they made some jokes about it. And then, then it actually tied into the story. Line. It tied into the story. Because, because if he didn't have the beard, the children wouldn't necessarily have confused him for Santa Claus or exactly. Or maybe. And let's talk about dear sweet Ronnie. <laughs> he had, he had quite the arc. I, I really love what they did with this character. He wasn't just the bumbling fool that he has been. And, you know, they've done a really, really good job at keeping him relevant. But I really, really liked what they did with him in these he has two so episodes. Many, he has so many facets that I didn't really see in the season one. Yeah. Um, just in terms of, of you saw him, you know, kind of complaining about things and then working through those exact same issues throughout throughout the episodes yeah. and then you also got to see that more personal like brother-in-law side of him um towards the end with with Tess and and that was just really sweet to see that that even though I mean they almost seem like they were the siblings you know yeah. that she was his sister they're so close and it's just so nice to see that and to know that he's there for them. You know, he's there for her. Well, and they're the only family that one another have now. With with Chuck gone, they're it. So play nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and he also had some great humor. I that was some of my favorite scenes of the whole of the whole movie when uh, when he was when introducing he himself. Keep his foot out of his mouth with Paul. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, there was that in multiple scenes, right? Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. When Paul came up to the front desk and Ronnie just started, I, said, I just wanted to say, shut your mouth, Ronnie. Shut your mouth, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, this 
poor sweet man. You have no idea who you're talking to. And then he tries to backpedal and it just ends up digging a bigger hole. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny that you would say that he complained about a lot of the same things that he was working through because the car, he would not leave people alone about the car. And even though he was paying for it himself, it was still the kids saying, I want a car, I want a car, I want a car. You know? <laughs> Well, exactly. Like the kids were all telling him what they wanted. And he was just going on about how much they are me, 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 and what I want, what I want. And yet he was doing the exact and same and thing. Greedy kids, that's that. <laughs> but then also just how he worked through it, reading the letters, hearing the kids sit on his lap and telling him what he wants and making that connection that here I was complaining about kids being so greedy I, I don't know that he made the connection specifically to how he was talking about the car, but he made the connection to these kids aren't actually being greedy. These kids are, are really looking out for each other. And the children that should have the most wants actually have the least because they're appreciating what they have. I, I, love, I, love, what, I love what he said to Lillian your kids have suffered more than anyone else. And I just went, oh, <laughs> that, that part just made me tear up. I could not believe how insightful he was. And it just really showed the depth of, of how it is affecting Ronnie. And I mean, it's meant to be, I think it's meant to be a little humorous, just child after child after child, a pony for Roy, a pony for Roy. <laughs> but it was so, so sweet. And it just showed how united they were and what they wanted was so simple. You know, their own, their own Christmas wishes. I mean, I look at what's under the tree of some kids now, and I think little Violet, oh. all she wants is a, all she wants is a wagon. She just wants a radio <laughs> flyer. Red just wants wagon. to and pull stuff think, around. <laughs> I just think, oh my goodness, how simple, how pure of a desire. But Lillian can't even afford to do a toy for each child and she just feels terrible about that and so with the disappointment that maybe Mr. Stewart isn't Santa they still pull together and say we all want a pony for Roy and that's just well and think about that I loved that conversation when they were talking about wishes they're like maybe it needs to be a really worthy wish mm -hmm. to come true. Yeah. And, and, and that then they thought about what can we do so that it is. And they knew that was the right thing to do. Right. When, when, when Mary Louise said, forget the raggedy Ann doll. I want a pony for Roy. It's just, it just made me giggle. It was really, it was the sweetest. It really was. And then every child got his or her wish, which I thought was so beautiful for the kids to reignite their belief in hope, their belief in Santa, their belief in Christmas magic. And it reignited hope in Lillian. You know, she was having a really hard time. I don't know if I can do this by myself. I don't know um, I, if I can do this alone, but she really, just like she said, I really do have some wonderful friends. It, it just, I let's let's go through what those Christmas wishes were really quick. So we we got Theo with Lincoln Logs. Theo wanted the Lincoln Logs. We oh, mentioned. So I know. I just want to build. <laughs> And then Violet wanted the radio flyer wagon. Do you remember what Vincent wanted? No. Train set. 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, Vincent's the one who wanted the train set. That was a really cute interaction. But look at this. Oh, a train set. That's <clears throat> a little pricey for Santa. <laughs> I just thought, oh, poor Gabe. <laughs> he's, he's caught in the middle there. <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to connect on a level that is that is common with Vincent. He's trying he's trying to to find common ground with them, but then he's trying to support Lillian. Like, wait, no, 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 don't give him false hope. Then we talked about uh, Mary Louise with ra- with the Raggedy Ann doll and Roy with his pony and Nora, Nora with her puzzles. Oh my goodness. I, I Sweet. loved watching Nora do her puzzles. And did, did your heart break when Roy destroyed the Oh my gosh. I just went, no, something's going to happen to the puzzle. Something's going to happen. I knew it was going to be the puzzle. I, I, at first I thought maybe he was just going to go down and finish it. And then she was going to be mad that that she wasn't included. Um, Mm -hmm. But I thought this worked so much better because then they got to build that together. Yeah. And Roy recognized what he did. And he worked really hard to put it back. He stayed up all night to do it. And then the kids saved the last piece for him. And he still wouldn't do it. He's like, no, this is for you. This is your puzzle. Oh, you know, it's so, it's so sweet to see good, kind hearted, selfless children who, like Ronnie said, have suffered more than anyone, but they still know how to be kind. And, and, you know, maybe Roy's, maybe Roy's uh, coming out of his shell was a little quick, but, you know, there's only so much you can do with two hours. And, I, you know, I chalk it up to Christmas magic right there. <laughs> it's a, it's a oh, Christmas miracle. Of course. <laughs> but, you know, the whole, the whole thing of him getting what he wished for before his dad died, you know, it brought dad's promise full circle. It brought mom's promise of everything is going to be all right, full circle. And he <laughs> could let his heart out of its shell. And it, yeah, it just Ronnie, good, good job, Ronnie. You did a good thing, dude. <laughs> it was a really good thing. Um, I, I want to bring up that everything's going to be okay. I know that yeah. that that can be a controversial phrase for some parties, but I just yeah. want to say that I think it was a really nice way to work that phrase in. I know that is um, a phrase that Brian Berg use, uses all the time yeah. um, to get through things. And I liked that they kind of brought it up and and kind of shows that it doesn't it doesn't mean everything's perfect. It doesn't mean that that nothing bad happens. Um, and I think the quote was um, believing that that is true sees us through the hard times. Um, and then there was something about faith leading to joy. And it, it it was just such a nice moment to be like, it, it is important to have faith. It is important to believe and and everything's going to be okay can have different meanings to it. It doesn't, you know, it, it is a good thing to say. Sometimes you don't want to say that all the time, but <laughs> yeah, it, no, it's you know, true. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's really hard to hear when things yeah. aren't okay. It's really hard to hear that it's going to be okay because in some moments you don't feel that it way. It doesn't feel like um, it, but it was, I thought it was a nice way to work that sentiment in and to really explain why Lillian was saying it and yeah what it means to her yeah it, and it brought out Abigail's wisdom once again and her her ability to reach people with her wise words uh let's uh let's go let's go to Abigail let's talk about her <laughs> so I loved her entrance I loved her entrance. I thought it was the perfect way to bring her back. You know, you start yes, down at the absolutely. bottom, stepping off and then pan up and there's the face. 
and it would and just her looking around in delight. Here I am in Brookfield. It's just it was it was one of those it was one of those moments where you just sigh with happiness, you know? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, it was just like that nostalgia factor. Like, like yeah. this is somebody that we know really well. And we know her, if, if you're a Hardy and you've watched from the beginning, like there's, there's not very much of that on Gun Hope Falls because it's a newer show. And so a right. lot of these, these characters we've only known for a year. Um, and so to add in kind of that deeper emotional connection with someone, uh, especially at the very beginning of the special um, to really kind of pull you in and kind of attach you mm-hmm. to, to the town and to the characters and to the movie that you're going to be watching for two hours. It, it really had that, that pull um, yeah. to, to your heartstrings. What would you say was your favorite Abigail scene in the entire special? If you had to pick one, what would you pick? Really, really hard. Um, I, oh, I don't know if I can pick one, but um, I, I, I mean, obviously the moment with Dan, but um, in terms of just, you know, maybe reality of Abigail, um, I really yeah, love that she was that, talking no, no, that, 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 That's a whole that, other... That, that was oh, other. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's, ball of wax, right? That's a, so that's a total I really category. liked, <laughs> there were so many, but I really liked when she was um, in the infirmary with Maggie um, and her quote about, um, she said, in my hometown, we were always there for each other through joy and in grief. And what I learned is there's no journey like a shared one. And I think that really sums up who Abigail was yeah. and how things are in Hope Valley um, and how things really are in Brookfield and we're just now beginning to see that um, as we're getting to know the characters deeper after Mm -hmm. a year. And so I think not only did Abigail know the perfect thing to say to Maggie in the moment based on what was happening to Maggie, um, but I think it, it made perfect sense for that to be coming from Abigail. Yeah. Um, And, and really sums up everything she's been through. So true. So true. So I went the more humorous approach. You went the profound approach. <laughs> you went the profound route. I went, I went the more humorous, humorous route. My favorite scene, aside from the one that's off limits and its own category, was when she was helping Mountie Gabriel shop. I, that was cute. That was wonderful. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And the fact that Gabriel knew that he could go to Abigail, even though he had only known he, her. He has no, short... yeah, he has no history with her. Yeah, he has no history beyond helping her down and giving her a ride out to the orphanage. So, you know, they must have had a really nice long talk. You know? <laughs> but the fact that Mountie Gabe knows that he can go to her and he recognizes that not only is she a wise woman, but she's a very generous woman and she's willing to give out that wisdom to others. And she's always willing to help, you know, we were there for each other. So it just, it's all a summation of Abigail's character. (laughs) When she took the lid off the perfume. I know, I'm kind of like, why why is this perfume there? Why does he have this in the store if it smells this bad? If it smells like that, because he's a man. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I gotta say, I no offense, no offense to uh, Ned Yost, but this store is quite intriguing to me because they have they have everything. I mean, Ned is always having to order stuff for Hope Valley, and <laughs> I felt like everything people asked for was right there. It was quite, it was quite, I need a ham. It's upstairs on ice. I got it. And he had like one. That. He had one, one left. <laughs> you just have one left and it's like almost Christmas. This is amazing. <laughs> Ned needs an upstairs. <laughs> Ned needs an upstairs. Forget the back. I feel like he probably lives Room. upstairs. upstairs. I, I feel like Ned lives upstairs at the mercantile, but probably, but I was just like this. I'm so confused. You have everything, all these toys, all these, everything. 
I don't, I don't recall seeing that much stuff in, in the mercantile in Hope Valley. Maybe they're really close to the train station. They're a lot closer. I, I don't know. I'll get a few more things. <laughs> yeah. But when she took the lid off of that perfume, that, oh, you would not be a friend of Lillian's if you gave her this. <laughs> Oh, that was so funny. And then the, the comment, general rule of thumb, never give a woman. <laughs> never give a woman a household appliance. appliance. <laughs> and then I love his Christmas. reaction. Got it. <laughs> and then this scarf, it says, I like being your friend. Is that the message you want to send? Not exactly. <laughs> and then she, of course, ends with, her with her, her common, wisdom. Yeah. with her common wisdom speak from the heart you know it's and that's how many times has she said that in the past a million <laughs> pretty much yeah pretty much hmm. okay so are we ready to go to gabriel and lillian <laughs> Okay, I, I want to start off by just acknowledging I'm really glad that they started off season two, just generally letting people know pretty much right from the get go, we're moving in this direction. We're going to, these two yes. are, are together, we're, we're moving well, in this direction well, and, we're, and we're giving other people and we're giving other people a different direction and we're, we're showing you what we're doing. Um, I think yeah. that was a really good timing. Um, and really just nice to know, especially after such a long break, so much could have happened in that time since we've been in Brookfield that, um, it, it really would have just felt awkward to still be wondering in general. Well, and that's actually what I was saving. It was oh. <laughs> this, this idea, this idea of Sam and Maggie. What, what do you think about that? What do you think of that idea? Of, I um, loved it. I loved it. And I saw it. I could see it from the minute they were on screen together. The very uh -huh. first scene with them just chatting. And, and it wasn't blatantly obvious flirting or anything. But I was just like, oh, that's perfect. Gives, gives each character a direction. We're not really talking about any past feelings or, or questionable triangles. We're just saying, hey, I this is... This is where they are now. We've, we've moved into the future a little bit. This is where everybody is. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seemed really natural, like a, like a really good progression for all the characters. Did you, I, I have a slight confession. Season one, I was this close to shipping Joe and Maggie. I was like, oh. Well, well I think it was written cute. that way a little bit. I yeah. think it was written that way a little bit. I mean, they yeah. were, they had just met each other and they had some, I think some flirtation, um, um, but I didn't miss it. I still felt like mm -hmm. they had good chemistry as friends when they yeah. were on screen together in this. Um, when he's talking, right? <laughs> okay. I, I know we're getting off track now, but I loved that plot line. I thought it was so, so well done. I, I have to admit that if you're a baker and someone has told you, one day that they're allergic to cinnamon the next day i probably wouldn't give them something baked by someone else that i didn't know what the ingredients just were in case. just you know it might have been something that crossed my mind to find out what the ingredients were if i knew there were allergies but you know this was a different time allergies weren't quite as talked about and as common um right. so but yeah it seemed a little and i also would have been maybe a little concerned when he was like is this cinnamon I would have been like, oh my gosh, I'll find out. Um, but you know, beyond that, um, I, that was such a brilliant scene. It really showed Jefferson's acting chops. I just thought that was just a lovely comedic um, sequence. And I don't it, even know. I mean, he he made he made the difference between talking completely swelled up and talking only half swelled up. I I mean, I don't even. I can't even begin to think how I would move my tongue to make it sound like that. So it was yeah, so brilliantly that, done. 
It was. I loved that Maggie knew what he was saying when he was talking well, that Well, it way. took her a second, though. It took her a second. <laughs> um, but it gave me huge flashbacks to Lee having laryngitis. Ah! Um, and, yes, yes. and when calls the heart, because it was that same kind of very, very exaggerated physical comedy. Mm -hmm. and, and on when calls the heart, I would not say anybody should try to do that besides Kevin, because he's so brilliant at it. Um, but I, I have huge props for Jefferson after seeing that scene. I'm like, oh, uh -huh. he's going to be, he's going to be the cabin of Brookfield. He's, <laughs> he's the cabin of Brookfield. He's going to be the one that gives us that, that kind of straight man side of the, of the comedy um, <laughs> and, and play off of other people to give us that comedy relief that we have um, in the other show. And I, I think that's amazing. It's true. It's true. I, when, when that whole thing happened and then, Joe, Santa Claus is meant to bring children joy, not to frighten them. You know? <laughs> it was it was so perfect. This the whole scene, the scene as a whole was just perfect. Okay, going back. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I just have to say, I just have to show my notes right here. Lillian <laughs> <laughs> kisses him written in caps with hearts around it Lillian kisses him I did not see that coming I did right. I mean I may I may have seen Mountie Gabriel trying to kiss her and getting interrupted but her Lillian moving in and then they actually kiss and twice Whoa! And My in a season premiere, blown. in a season premiere instead of a season finale, I mean that's big right there. So I hope that means this is going to be a nice romantic season. Uh <laughs> and I'm guessing, I'm guessing that she no longer has feelings for Sam. <laughs> I think again they made it nice and clear where the different paths are going, and we can yeah. just move forward knowing where we're going in season two and i think that's really nice and what is needed right now and and it's great because it really wasn't the main focus that romance wasn't the main focus of season one because we were really focused on grace and chuck and with them married and doing their thing um we can now you know move on to the next thing without it seeming like it's two romance stories competing um it can just be this new kind of focus um for the season um and i think that that is going to be their line actions speak louder than words i think that that's oh, going to be our callback that's going to be our callback in the future um instead of take a walk with me yeah um, I, know, I was just gonna say that's gay that's, so, that's lillian's take a walk with me actions that's speak louder than words gonna be. so yeah so, and, and I loved that there was something that was kind of an obvious, I mean, it was said a few different times throughout the show. He said it once back to her. Was it during the football game? I think. Yes. Yes, I believe so. Um, and so I think, I think they, they did a good job kind of cementing that that's kind of the line that will connect them. That's their theme. <laughs> and I think that's a great theme for a couple. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's also uphold the right. Oh, wait, that's the Mounties motto. The, that's the Mounties motto. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, you know, it's better than uh, if, if the Mounties wanted you to have a wife, they decided you would. You would. <laughs> yeah, that's a little better. <laughs> and, you know, I, I loved how they used it because um because in the in the beginning with joe and gabe you know i thought the two of you were almost an item <laughs> it's like did they say that back in the 19 in the, in the 1910s you know <laughs> but but um but then he says what's the mountie motto uphold the right what could be more right than pursuing the woman of your dreams and then Gabe kind of takes that and runs with it and says, as a Mountie, I'm sworn to uphold the truth. 
And the truth is, I have feelings for you. I, I couldn't believe that he was that explicit with his words. I went, whoa, what? <laughs> and then, <laughs> let's talk about actions speak louder than words. Whoa, I still, I mean, <laughs> my husband was sitting right next to me when I watched it for the first time. <laughs> He had to catch me almost. I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I, I, a, a feather could have knocked me over. It was, I was not expecting that, <laughs> but I liked it. If, I think you know, it's if the nice. If season is going to start nice. like that, then exactly. who knows? The season's going to yeah. start like that. And I think it's a good reminder of Lillian as a character. Um, she is a very forward person and she's very confident, you know, she, she has some, some, you know, self-confidence sometimes, um, issues sometimes with, you know, trying to figure out how to do all this on her own when she was doing it with a lot of help before. Um, but that's natural. And just in general, her personality is very, very sure of herself. Mm -hmm. Um, and it keep in mind, been, this is very, it just hasn't been so sure in romance. So well, I think she was very focused on other things. Yeah, it's true. And I think um, it's, you know, she's been doing this. She's been doing running the orphanage on her own for a while now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably really kind of built up her security and, and her faith in, in herself. Yeah. Um, and also it seems that, that she and Gabe have been spending a lot more time together in the off season. Um, and really developing that bond, um, the two of them. So, so speaking it was nice of, yeah, speaking of spending time together, the football game. Were you getting season four? When calls the heart vibe? Of course. Oh my and God. I'm so glad that they referenced it later too. I know. Um, which we, which I'm we'll so talk glad about. But, that. <laughs> but there was so much in this movie that referenced completely indirectly things that have happened before um, in Hope Valley. And, and it was a great nod to the Hardys just to be like, we got you, we see you, we know um, that having those connections makes sense to the fan base. And, um, it, and it's important to the, to us, to them. Yeah. And, and I really felt like that really was valued in this, in this movie. And that was one way it was like, that the baseball game in When Calls the Heart was a very big piece, even though it only took place in one episode. Yeah. It was a very big memory mm -hmm. um, for the town. And, and that was nice to tie that in and have it be a little different. And, and, and the comment about, oh, they're talking about doing a uh, professional league next year. And, yeah. and that is the NFL that started in 1920. So, yeah. Um, you know, it was a great nod to historical facts uh, and still, you know, to make it relevant to be like, oh, yeah, that is about the time this was becoming popular um, around around the area. So but then you have the two captains <laughs> getting will totally say, flirty with each other. <laughs> I will say it sparked a huge conversation at our house because I was like, OK, playing football in the snow, in a dress, with a shawl. Oh, no thanks. I was like, I don't think so. Um, but, you know, then, you know, my husband was even saying, he was like, oh, you know, girls had skirts in his school when he was, when he was growing up. And, oh. and that's, you know, that was part of the, the school uniform and they mm -hmm. would wear pants under their skirts when they went out to play. And, you know, it was snowy there a lot. So he lived in the Midwest. So, so he's it like, totally yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. He's like, that, that actually happened. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> I think probably my favorite callback to When Calls the Heart, um, besides the obvious one, it has to be when Abigail says, I know that look. What look? What is it about young women and Mounties? <laughs> it, it was the perfect line. It was the perfect there were line. there were many perfect lines in this. Yeah. I, I 
I, I huge shout out to Alfonso was the, I mean, I know he's the head writer for the show, but he, he was the writer for these episodes and just mm-hmm. amazing. And, and I know that's always been a goal of his is to make connections to the past and, and to really make sure that there's a good balance of, of the humor and the heartfelt um, emotions in, in an episode. But I just felt like he, he really nailed it in, in these, in these two Absolutely. episodes, really pulling in the nostalgia from when falls the heart and the first season of, of when hope falls, but also helping it stand on its own and, yeah. and showing you who these characters were, um, who you're going to have for the rest of the season and really, you know, creating kind of both of those worlds, but showing how they're interconnected. Yeah. So really quick, let's talk about Tess. We, we can't, we can't have this recap without Tess. No. And I, I was so, so glad for the flashbacks because I was so glad for the flashbacks because they really, really showed that connection to Chuck and it showed the reason why she is so angry and why she is so driven to make it through the holidays and Mm -hmm. just, and how much she misses him and how much she feels neglected by him. Well, and, and there's that connection to like, I I don't think she was doing it on purpose, but that like, I don't have family to be with. So why, why would I let other people go and be with their family? Yeah. Um, (laughs) I have to, I have to say one thing. So when she said, I gave everyone the rest of the week off, my husband who grew up on, uh, on a farm for part of his life said, what was it? No, 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 no. You, you, you need, somebody has to be there. Somebody Somebody has to be there to do the minimal chores. Now don't make them repair that fence. That's going to take, you don't need to do the extra stuff. You need somebody there for the minimal chores. (laughs) Well, and in theory, that would have already been planned. I'm thinking so. Yes. And so oh, I'm I sure said, she just, means the people just, that were going to be off. Yeah. Oh. I, I had to, I had to shush him again. <laughs> well, um, I will say that was the only, oh, I was going to say the scene with Lillian and Tess. I, that, that was mm. really nice to see that, that Lillian was still trying to connect with her. Um, Cause she tried the entire first season. <laughs> yeah. And it seemed like they were sort of getting somewhere. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but that was a really nice scene, but I will say that's the one I am a little unclear on the timeline here because it's been two years since the show was on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would think they're trying to be in the same time frame as when calls the heart. They've always had the like one season per year. I would think with having any sort of, um, communication between the two shows which we didn't exactly cover yet but there was some communication between characters on this show and characters from one calls the heart and so I would would think that you're trying to be in roughly the same time frame Mm -hmm. so Lillian said one Christmas I've spent one Christmas with my sister Is that mm. accurate? I that would be the episode of when calls the heart that they get. Now, guessed. now here, now here's a possibility. Here's a possibility. Remember that, or no, it wasn't. Remember, Grace left to take what was her name? the The beautiful girl who got reunited with her grandfather. Yes. Uh, I, I, mm. ah. I'm okay. Never mind. Um, but, uh, she took her to London. Helen? Was it Helen? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. It was Helen. Um, she took her to London. And so you have all of that travel and we don't know. We don't know how long it was before, before she Chuck followed her. Followed. Okay. Because so, this was, okay, because that was where my confusion was. I was like, okay, she may have been gone for a few years, but then 
Tess is saying this the first time she's without Chuck for Christmas. It's, yeah, because so he could have followed. He could have followed later. After. Enough later, like a year later? I don't know. It, it, it confused me. That was the one part that confused me. And I was like, what year is it? <laughs> yeah, but see, he followed after Grace after she left to take Helen to London. So we don't know how long he waited before he decided he couldn't live without her. Oh, <laughs> I know. I hope if they come back someday, maybe we get like a flashback episode of how that would, oh, I hope it so. would be really great. I hope so. Really I, I really do. That, that would be so, so amazing. It, oh, I would that love to see, see that. I would love to see that. Speaking of that uh, letter, <laughs> that communication, <laughs> Somebody got an honorable mention, not once, but once. two times, two times in this special. There, I, I am loving that interconnectedness of the two shows in that way, because, you know, last season of One Calls the Heart, there were numerous mentions and references to Henry communicating with Abigail. And so it three, I think. I, I think there were at three, least at least three. Yes. Yeah, at least three um, specific mentions. And to to then finally see Abigail, it, it makes perfect sense that you're going to reference that again. Um, so I thought that was really lovely. It it really intrigued me that she seemed so urgent about getting a letter mail to him. I know. Um, like what could be so urgent? It's in that letter. Yeah, that sounds quite interesting. So um I'm interested to see if that plays into season nine, when falls the heart, I, I kind of have a feeling we'll be hearing something about it in one of the shows, if not both. Um, Do you think it's possible that Martin Cummins is going to make a special guest star appearance on one calls on one hope calls? So you want my theory? Sure. Do it. My, my theory is that he may do more than a guest appearance on When Hope Calls. Oh, you think that he's going to become a semi-regular, if not a regular? I I think I think it's gonna depend on where things go with Abigail. I know nothing has been confirmed by anybody, anybody. at this point in time. So this is pure speculation on my part in terms of where the storyline looks like it could go, which uh -huh. I think they did on purpose to just open up possibilities, whether they're doing it now or not. They, I'm, it's always good writing to, to leave something open for the future. Um, I think it's set up very nicely for Abigail to live in Brookfield at some point in the future. If if that comes to fruition, and if she would, that would make perfect sense for Henry to make appearances, whether that be regular or moving there. He's clearly at a crossroads in Hope Valley. He, we love him. Of course we love him. And, and the town has grown to most of them love him um, and get along <laughs> with him for the most part. A lot of people really do truly care about him and look out they for do. him. And, and, and I think he feels that way back towards most of them as well. Um, it's it's really been a lovely way to see his character arc over the years, but but he's almost kind of at a point where he doesn't know where he's going and he doesn't know what's next for him. And and I could yeah, his, very uh, much, he had could this very deep, much he had this deep kinship that we didn't know about with Ned Yost. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, where'd that come from? I'd like to Ned see that Barry. explored more. Yeah, <laughs> now Ned's married, so he can't, uh -oh. he can't chat over a beer the way that he probably could have in the past. <laughs> um, it just seems to me that if you were going to do something, now is a time when he could potentially make a move like that. And it would sure. make sense for his character. It would make sense for Abigail's character. Um, it would infuse a little bit more drama into Brookfield. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> because we don't really have somebody like that in, in this show. And so that could be a, a possible direction that they could head in the future. If that happens, I still, I mean, it sounds like Martin's film season nine. We'll see him in season nine. They might set up a move at the end of that season or somewhere in the middle to set that transition up because they haven't filmed season two yet of When Hope Calls. And so right. there's 
plenty of opportunity for something to happen in season nine of One Calls the Heart to further set up some movement for season two that I assume will air sometime after season nine ends, um, just based on the scheduling of filming that is probably happening. Yeah. Um, so that would, that's kind of where I feel they've set it up for whether that's going to happen immediately or somewhere down the line or not at all, who knows. Um, but I, I could see that. And I think it would be nice. And I, the reason I really truly think they're looking at that is because they also had a Henry mention from Tess. And so they've given us reason to suspect that there would be more drama than just the Henry Abigail drama. There would be Tess Henry drama. Um, and so that could really, you know, set up for that. And also I want to, I want to flash back to Gowan was the hero of the Christmas movie with the orphans in Hope Valley. Sure. And, and I think that could be really sweet to see him interacting with the orphanage in some way. I don't know if we could bear another Henry Gowan and orphan interaction. <laughs> It, 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 it might be the perfect arc for him, but it might we'll be. see. We it will see. Be. Okay. Okay. Are we ready? I, I feel it would be a miss if we, if we went to this without just saying so thrilled to see Carter um, in the episode. He was an extension of Abigail um, having Cody appear on the show, seeing him with his mom. Of course, he's going to still be with his mom. Um, so lovely to just see that mother son together. Yeah. And for them to be in interaction with orphans, we were talking about this before we started recording. It just was. It's full circle. It's like, so she, Gail has adopted children and here she is helping the orphans and yeah. Oh, it's so, oh. it's so fitting to see Cody with her and to see him helping Roy and trying mm -hmm. to help Roy come out of his shell. And, and, uh, and even he went up there and said to Santa he, that he wanted, he up there. Uh, he's rooting for Roy. for Roy. Yeah. 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 It was very sweet. It was very it sweet. Was. I'm so glad Carter was available to participate. That was really yeah. sweet. Because it made everything make sense. It really yes. did. Okay. okay, big moment. Big, big moment. <laughs> the biggest. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this. You're going to have to help me. <laughs> okay, Hardys, take a walk with us through Abigail's dream. Whoa. Yeah, we, we all kind of suspected it was going to be, I mean, they didn't flat out tell us it was going to be a dream, but they told us it was Jack and they've also told us Jack is gone. So we knew, we knew this was going to be some sort of a dream sequence or I, I was hoping with story. every fiber of my being that it was, I was like, please make it a dream. Please make it a dream. Please make it a dream. You know, it's just, it, it had to be, it had to be a dream for everything to go seamlessly and to make sense, you know, and I did, I really did like that they set it up with uh, Gabe talking to Abigail about Nathan and Jack Thornton. I think that. Oh my gosh. I, we, let's stop for a second. Did we know that? We didn't know that Gabe knew Jack, did we? That was. No, we knew that he knew Nathan, obviously, because Nathan made appearances in Brookfield, but had no idea that Gabe oh. knew who Jack was. And, and not so, only that, not only did he knew him, he served in the in the Northern Territories with him. That's yeah. pretty huge that Gabe also went through that type of experience. Yeah, that that gave that gave Jack such a hard time. And just to hear, I don't know, just to hear the name Jack Thornton come out of Gabe's mouth. A, a fellow, a, a fellow uh, constable, a fellow Mountie. I don't know. It, it, it gave me a rush of chills. It, it really did. I, I felt like it really elevated kind of the Mountie storyline that uh -huh. wasn't super big in this, in this episode. I mean, um, 
I, I felt like it really kind of brought in, in more of that, more of that drama. Mm -hmm. So the very first line that is spoken, she's closed up for the night. Do you think that that sure. was, Oh, that was Daniel's RJ voice. voice. No, that was, that was Daniel's voice. You, I, the very, very first line. I, I, I mean, maybe because I knew it was him, I was hearing things, but I swear it was him. It was him. See, I mean, I have to watch it I, again. I listened, I went back and I listened to it several times and I said, I you think, think they, that they had, had RJ Hatanaka. I think they had, I mean, it was a dream, so it could have been. So it totally could have worked. Yeah. Because I could hear a shift. I could hear a shift in the voice. And so I think that they had RJ Hatanaka record that first line and then it moved That's a into good question. I, I will, I'm going to go back and listen to it again now and see what I think. But <laughs> initially I, I really thought it was Daniel. Um, but of course she would, either way, she would still assume that it's Mountie Gabe because yeah. <laughs> why would it not be? Why would it be exactly? Why? Okay. Okay. So we knew what was going to happen. Like you said. So can we you were, imagine if we didn't know? Oh gosh. <laughs> I think we would have all been, I, there would have been thuds heard all around the world. <coughs> of that would have been crazy. Painting. Right. <laughs> so we knew this was, was going to happen. We knew that Lori, at least most of us have heard the story, that Lori Lachlan called Dan and asked him to be a part of it, which I thought was so sweet, and that the two of them reconnected in a place that isn't exactly Hope Valley, but is as close to Hope Valley as you're going to get. And it just, so, you know, which, that which honestly is better. Which yeah. is better. I, I mean, I know that's an argument between some people that they, they don't see it that way. I, my opinion is that Jack, especially you couldn't have him appear in Hope Valley. It would be too traumatic. It would be too emotional. It would be, it would get in the way of what, what the show is trying to do, but also what, what Jack's sentiment was. I'm, I'm happy that she's moving on. I'm proud of her. And, and, and that it. would get, in the, right way, here. I, that would get in the down. way of her moving on if she saw him herself. I, even in a dream, I feel like that would be in the way, in the, in this sense, because let's be honest, it was a dream, but it was more than a dream because it was a Christmas movie. There was more to it and, and you can see it if you wanna see it and you don't have to see it if you didn't wanna see it. But the intention of that scene was that, that he was coming to her in a dream, not just that her subconscious was thinking about him. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, uh, the, the intent of the scene was written that way in my opinion. And, and, if, if, and I think she knows that because of the way they spoke to each other. Um, if, the, if he came to Elizabeth and she felt like he was coming to her in a dream, that could be very traumatic and very difficult for her in some ways, or, or at least just extend her period of, of being ready to move on. <laughs> I, I will admit I wanted a dream sequence on One Calls the Heart to, uh, for Jack to kind of help Elizabeth make the decision or to, oh, yeah. If it had happened last year, yes. But moving forward, I don't see how where they're okay, at now, I see. now that she has already decided to move on. I see. I, I feel see. like it okay. would just be backtracking a little bit. Um, and I think it'd be harder I for still fans. still wouldn't mind, but. <laughs> I also think it'd be harder for fans to see them together again. Which is, which, which is true. Yeah. So I wrote down, I wrote down oh, what good. you said. Oh, good. <laughs> Let her know I'm happy she's moving on with her life. Let her know she's doing a fine job with little Jack and I could not be prouder of either of them. And let her know 
that true love never dies. I know that now more than ever. Goodbye, Abigail. Beautiful town. And I love how he kept going back to the town. He kept that's going. Why I feel like Abigail will end up there at some point, whether that's permanently or or another appearance or something. I Jack feel is like kind of giving his seal of approval. She's for telling her that it's a good choice that she's probably considering already in her mind, even if she hasn't mm-hmm. said it out loud. Um, I otherwise, why did he come to her then? Yeah. Well, and it, I couldn't, I couldn't help but just kind of give a laughing sob. That's the only way I can think to say it. It's a beautiful town where another Mountie loves a good woman. Bears and deers all over the place. <laughs> what was that? Bears and deers all over the place. <laughs> all about, or how is that how she said it? All about bears and deers all yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which I will say what that was my perfect line from the whole show. I thought you could not have a better callback than to where where another Mountie loves a good woman and the bears and deers. I think if because that was one of the best Abigail Jack scenes ever was the bears and deers. So to have that specific callback in that moment between the two of them, I yeah. thought was like, it wouldn't have made sense with anybody else. But the fact that this is the two of them coming back together in this very special moment, probably most likely the only, the last time we may see Daniel in a, in a Mountie uniform. Um, that's the way he's, that's the way Daniel's saying it in interviews right now. So this yeah. is probably his last appearance as Jack. Um, you know, having that and having that be a poignant moment of return for Lori to acting in general, I think to have that special moment just be about the history of their two characters and the two of them, um, it was really sweet. And it was also a very funny reference to a very funny part of the history of the show. The only thing that would have been better is something with flies and honey well yes that, that would have that's, that's, also, but it was the same the, conversation that's the only yeah. line that could have topped it and yeah. it, and then like we said I'm more of a I'm more into baseball if you remember <laughs> just okay yes, to have so, those references so, so beautiful. Sarah, tell me your overall reaction the first time you watched it the whole movie or that scene this scene. <laughs> that this scene. scene. This scene. I was sobbing. I was sobbing through that scene. Yeah. I, I was it was sobbing. just hearing. I mean, I've seen Daniel and other things too since then. And I've watched old episodes of it. Hearing his voice without his natural accent with his Jack voice. And <laughs> in the red surge, in the red surge with the hat. It's seeing emotional. Him, seeing him hold the hat at his side while he hugged her with one hand because that is such a bizarre example of who Jack is like he's so professional he's not even going to drop his hat when he's dead and he sees one of his best friends like come on drop the hat you have to put your arms around them he is so um just oh I don't noble he's just noble and professional and and he's going to stand at attention and do the right thing. And, and, and that was just so him. And he carries himself. Daniel carries himself as Jack. With so beautiful. Dignity. There, thank you. That is such the perfect word. Um, and he just, and he, he said everything the way I would expect Jack to say it. And he, I mean, that just goes from the fact that, you know, Alfonso was writing and, and he knows the history of everything and values the history of everything. Sometimes you get writers who don't value that history. And I really feel like, like that is something that is strong here. And it was, it was so beautiful. And, and I mean, Lori can act. I mean, I don't think anybody (laughs) can argue that. Her tears, which were probably, a little real probably there was probably some tears some real tears going on there um 
that was very emotional to watch that. Well, and watching her feel him, you know, where, where are the wounds? Where are the scars? Your she, yeah, body she wasn't intact. just looking at his face. She was looking at his body. Like your this. body is intact. How is feel. this possible? Yeah. <laughs> and one thing, one thing that probably made me cry harder than anything else. Did you see how he stood taller and had even more pride in his voice when he said little Jack? He's never gotten to say that. No, he hasn't. And I mean, when, when he said she's doing a fine job with little Jack, and I just went, <laughs> he's so proud of his son you know it's just oh it was it it was a teeny tiny little nuance but I noticed it but he's so good he's so good at those he's Daniel's so always good, good at those. those little nuances oh so man I just I feel like just being in a scene with him I would just kind of go uh-huh right yeah, that would be so more. hard teach me more teach me more <laughs> It, it honestly, there, there's something about this scene where, I mean, it was brilliant. It, it was brilliant of Lori for many reasons to, to come up with this idea and, and yeah. so great that they, that they worked with her on that. And, and I'm so glad Daniel wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, it really was kind of that perfect coming together of everything because it, it wasn't crucial to the storyline of the movie. It wasn't. That was going, the one thing I, I wanted. I mean, I felt to- like that missed. I but at the same time, more. at the same time, it was so great because it was almost like this doesn't matter to this movie. It matters to Hardy's mm-hmm. and it yes. matters to the, the, I, I, I don't know how, what to call it. Like the, we have a universe now. It's like the Marvel universe. It's like, <laughs> we've got a world. We've got the Hardy's universe. Hardy's universe. And these towns are now. Um, connected deeper than they were before yeah. and and this was not there for the movie this was there for the world this was there to make sense of things and to give closure in areas that it was needed in and to help people wherever they're at um, with different things and to to just be a, a gift to Hardy's and a gift to yeah. the characters and a gift to the actors to have that, to have more closure, um, because Jack wasn't there when he died. So there was very little closure. He'd been gone for a while and, yeah. and, and there wasn't that piece of closure. And I just, I feel like this was not done for the movie. It was done for the greater entity of the show. Um, all that, the characters all and, and all the fans. That, that is true. That, that is totally true. I wanted it to play more into the episode. I wanted there to be callbacks or, you know, you know, someone says something and it brings the dream back to Abigail's mind or something. I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be more uh, integrated into this, into the plot line of the second episode. But if it hadn't been included, I would have been devastated. (laughs) So like you said, the fact that it was there, it was more of a gift for us as fans and them as actors to get to be on screen together and recreate the characters and recreate the history and the nostalgia that these characters have together than it was to move the story forward. But I also do feel like it will move Abigail forward in some way. Whether I think it, we I think it will. whether we see Lori again or not, even if we don't see Lori again, we've talked about Abigail now on both shows. Both mm-hmm. shows can now reference Abigail freely mm-hmm. um, at any time. Um, and yeah. you know, Gowan can talk about the letter he received on Christmas from <laughs> Abigail. Like whether we see her again or not, it, it can set something up. Um, somebody can talk, could potentially talk on When Calls the Heart about um, Abigail's dream about Jack. Or, you know, I mean, there are ways for this to leave behind something more later. This can be integrated. 
it can still be played into at some point in time. Yeah, just because it wasn't part of the storyline for the rest of this episode doesn't mean that it can't play into others. That that's a that's a really good point. Okay, we made it through without crying. <laughs> uh, <Yay>! Yes. <laughs> All right, Hardies. Thank you so much for joining Sarah and me for this discussion of When Hope Calls. We are so excited to get to cover more. Coming up, our goal, I said this on our announcement, but in case you missed it, our goal is to cover season two of When Calls the Heart before season nine comes out. (laughs) We will see how that goes. That is the goal and we are going to do our very best. Um, (laughs) And, and stay tuned because I said before, I am, I am a bigger fan of season two than most parties are. Um, And I, I I am looking forward to bring, I mean, there's so much great content in season two that a lot of Hardys agree with. Just a lot of the stuff was amazing in that season. Um, but I do tend to like some of the things that other people maybe didn't care for as much, um, in season two. Um, and, and I, I, I preface that with, I liked it in how it set up future things, um, in a very nice way. Wasn't necessarily that I love certain characters that other people disliked, but I, I saw their purpose. I saw their purpose and I'm, I'm looking forward to pointing that out and um, debating some of those issues with Cammy because we've, we've debated them before <laughs> and it will be interesting to see how, how that debate goes on the this podcast. Will be interesting. I hope our friendship remains intact after <laughs> season two. <laughs> all right, everybody. Happy new year. Love to you all. Bye. See you later. <laughs>